Um, sadly, I probably won't get to the Hamiltonians, which might be the most interesting part, but uh, I'll point to, to where that comes in. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a small part of uh, convex optimization that I've been thinking about for the past year and a half or so. Actually, most of the talk might be review if you already know convex optimization. But I'll be focusing on, uh, on this notion of relative smoothness that's happened in the last five years, point out my part of the story. Uh, and really, all of that development will sort of be so that I can frame what I think is a cool uh, sort of mystery at the core of all of this uh, work. So the setting that we're going to be considering uh, is a pretty classical setting of convex optimization. We're going to assume that someone's given us uh, some function f, which takes as arguments uh, points in a finite dimensional real vector space, uh, usually Euclidean, let's say. And our goal is going to be to find the minimizing argument x star. We're going to assume for this talk that f is convex and twice continuously differentiable. And we're going to glaze over a lot of the technical details. Uh, and in particular, I'm not going to talk much in the exposition about the issue of constrained domains. So the picture I want you really to keep in mind is the picture on the left, which is a function of, of two dimensions plotted as the contour lines of the surface or the sublevel sets. And the goal, it's actually just a quadratic. And the goal in this problem is starting anywhere in space to find the little star. And the protagonist of the story is going to be the vector of first partial derivatives, otherwise known as the gradient. And we're going to think about methods that use this gradient map evaluated locally at points in space. And the question is going to be, how quickly can we optimize the, problem, the, the function we're interested in, or how quickly can we solve our problem? The first uh, algorithm that you might learn in a convex optimization course, or one of the first ones, is the so-called gradient descent algorithm. And it's based on the insight that the anti-gradient points instantaneously downhill of our function. And so the algorithm is quite simple. Starting at any point x0 in space, uh, we're going to sort of step down the level sets of the function by following the anti-gradient for some fixed uh, step size, L inverse. And so here I'm plotting on, the, on, on, on our plot the iterates of some gradient descent algorithm in blue uh, with the red arrows representing the position, the direction of the position update that follows the anti-gradient. Right, so then the question is, OK, well, does that system converge? Uh, and if so, what kind of convergence can we expect? So here uh, I'm plotting as a function of the iteration counter i, the logarithm of the function's value at a point at, at an iterate x sub i as a gap to the minimizing argument f of x star. So we could distinguish between three kinds of behavior at least on, on this kind of plot. Well, first of all, the system might not converge at all. That would be sad. Uh, if it does converge, it might co converge what we would call sublinearly. So that would mean that we're converging like a logarithm to minus infinity, some constant times a logarithm. Or it might be converging linearly, like minus i to minus infinity. So in the sort of classical analysis of gradient descent, there are two conditions that are widely studied. And uh, it's pretty easy to show that gradient descent converges linearly when the function f is what is known as strongly convex and smooth. Smooth is obviously massively overloaded in all kinds of literatures. But usually in convex optimization, it means this. And the basic uh, conditions are, uh, respectively, that for strong convexity, that the matrix of second partial derivatives can be lower bounded in the partial order of positive semi-definite matrices by some positive constant times the identity. And for smoothness, that you can upper bound it with some positive constant. And so here, a little animation on our cleverly chosen function, which is smooth and strongly convex, gradient descent converges linearly. Are the two L's that you had the same? Uh, yes. Uh, you really need L. The previous L has to be um, an upper bound on this L, but yes, they're, they're, they're the same. Sorry, what's the smoothness mean here? So smoothness, yeah, it's the colors. So smoothness means the upper bound, and uh, strong convexity means the lower bound. Actually, there are obviously equivalent first order conditions uh, on the gradient map of the function. That's how this is traditionally presented. But I think for intuition, and, and we'll see later on, this is a nice way to think about it. And sort of the, the, um, the, the sort of punchline of this is to say that in this analysis, 
we think of the Hessian of F, or this matrix of second partial derivatives, as being modeled essentially by two constants, above and below. OK, so well, what can go wrong if we remove these, these conditions? OK, so the function on the left is not a smooth function at its minimum. This is a function that is behaving uh, like the power 4 thirds. And so the Hessian at the minimum at the star is unbounded. Uh, and intuitively, functions that are not smooth have some amount of sort of sharpness in, in, in their surface. The function on the right is not strongly convex. It's behaving like the power 4 at its minimum. Uh, and functions that are not strongly convex have some amount of flatness in their surface. So smoothness is the condition that we use uh, to prove the convergence of fixed step size gradient descent. So if you were to just naively try to run gradient descent on uh, a function like uh, this one, you would find that the iterates don't converge unless you do something slightly more clever. Strong convexity is the condition that's used to prove the sort of linear convergence or the speed of fixed step size gradient descent. And so on this function that is not strongly convex, uh, the iterates are converging to the little star, but we get this sublinear convergence. And in fact, a convergence rate of 1 over i is guaranteed for smooth convex f um, as long as you take, take the step size uh, 1 over l to be smaller than, than, the smooth, than 1 over the smoothness constant. OK, so you might be asking yourself, well, OK, that's all well and good, but maybe we can be more clever with how we use our gradients. For example, do we really need strong convexity? And this is where, in the sort of theory of convex optimization, actually we've learned a whole lot. So in uh, 1983, Nemirovsky and Yudin famously showed the following kind of lower bound. So they showed that for any method that uses only the local and black box evaluation of the gradient map of f, and obviously the whole meat of the idea is held in those two concepts of local and black box, which I won't really unpack. But the essence is that you can't really constrain the class of functions that you can expect your algorithm to be exposed to on any information other than this local evaluation of the gradient map at the points you visited. Then for any such method, which includes gradient descent, and for any iteration counter i, there exists a smooth convex function such that the gap to the minimum in the function's value is lower bounded by something that's shrinking like 1 over i squared. And then not not far thereafter, Nestroff famously matches this bound with his accelerated gradient method. OK, and so since that, the sort of rest is history. Convex optimization is littered with these matching upper and lower bounds. Um, and if you look at a lot of the literature, this idea of modeling functions with constant models of their derivatives of some order, is, which corresponds to this idea of smoothness and strong convexity, um, that we just talked about. This idea of constant models of derivatives are essentially foundational. So I'm going to talk about a little bit of progress on this question and then uh, leading to the mystery at the end. OK, so for progress first. And this starts with, again, an old idea, which is the idea of mirror descent. Suppose we were trying to optimize over a space that had some kind of difficult geometry, for example, a simplex. So now we're not over a sort of really nice uh, RD, but we are trying to optimize over the simplex to find the little star. The basic idea behind mirror descent, and I'm not going to write the iteration, is that we can condition a gradient descent algorithm by mapping to a simpler dual space via some gradient map of some function, a strictly convex function h that we design, where in the dual space, uh, we can apply a gradient map uh, that is then conditioned in that space. And then by mapping back with the inverse of the gradient map of h, we get the mirror descent algorithm, which you can argue in some cases conditions our iteration to the sort of geometry of our original set. Sadly, maybe not sadly, because obviously these are very, the most useful are circumstances, the typical analyses of these methods assume still this kind of constant model for the derivatives of f or h in some order. And so this is where the progress of sort of new ideas occurred in the last three years. Boschka, Bolt, and Taboul in 2016 realized that mirror descent can be shown to converge simply under the relative conditions between the function that we're interested in and this designed reference function. 
So the only, among some other technical conditions, but the sort of real meat of the proof relies on the Hessian of f being upper bounded by some positive multiple of the Hessian of h in the partial order of positive semi-definite matrices. And the key point is that this can capture non-smoothness in both f and h simply by relating uh, them through this relationship. And so the example that they consider is uh, trying to optimize this kind of function uh, f of x, which is a Poisson linear inverse problem, which is non-smooth as you approach the origin because its second derivatives are blowing up, by using an h whose second derivatives are also blowing up as they approach the origin in a similar fashion. This is where I can sort of slot in my part of the story. Um, we realize that if f is string, string, strictly convex, then if you do this strange little flip on the mirror descent algorithm, you can exploit different relative conditions in a dual space. Now between a designed uh, reference function k and the convex conjugate of the function that you are interested in optimizing. Those conditions are pretty opaque. So actually, if you uh, rewrite equivalent conditions in the primal space, you get this kind of thing. And these are the conditions that we studied. And the essence of these conditions is that they relate the growth of the derivatives of second order to those of the first order through this function k. We call this dual space preconditioning. And the point is that under these conditions, you can also get convergent algorithms. And we're working on applications. But OK, the sort of take home of this little section is to say that sort of 2016, the constant model of, for example, second derivatives or first derivatives or third derivatives has really dominated the analysis of convex optimization. And now there's this interesting framework, uh, um, both the conditions that Boschka, Bolton, Taboul, and Lou Freund and Nestrov studied, and the dual space conditions that we do that can incorporate non-constant models. OK. So now I can frame the sort of mystery at the core of all of this. For a convex functions satisfying the smoothness condition, gradient descent achieves a rate of 1 over i. And Nestrov's uh, celebrated accelerated gradient descent is optimal within that class um, with a rate of 1 over i squared. For fu convex functions in the class uh, satisfying this inequality for some reference function h, the mirror descent algorithm achieves a rate of 1 over i. This is what Boschka, Bolton, Taboul showed. But there's no method that is known to be optimal. Obviously, if this is a quadratic, then Nestrov's is optimal. But in the more general class, relative to this, your choice of function h, there's no method that is known to be optimal. Lou Freund and Nestrov in their 2018 paper say they couldn't derive it, which is a bit terrifying. Um, and then in follow-up work, uh, Hansley, uh, oh, there's three authors. I forget all the three authors. I'm very sorry. Uh, provably achieve, uh, have, a mo ha have an algorithm that provably achieves 1 over i to the gamma for gamma in 1 to 2, depending on your choice of h. But as far as I know, this is not known to be optimal. Uh, and we're still trying to get a method that achieves 1 over i squared. OK. so. In the last minute, why do I think this is cool? Nestrov's accelerated gradient descent is still quite mysterious, at least to me. There's been uh, sort of other lines of inquiry looking at the sort of continuous time interpretation of the method, trying to, to sort of shed light on this algorithm. And my hope is that if we could find an optimal method under relative smoothness conditions, this might reveal a sort of deeper and simpler structure to the basic algorithm of acceleration. And then finally, this is sort of where it starts pointing to Hamiltonians. Acceleration has recently been connected to some non-autonomous Hamiltonian systems. This is the work of uh, Sue Boyd and Candez and some work out of Michael Jordan's group. And then finally, in another paper, we connect the sort of dual space version to conformal Hamiltonian dynamics, where this K of P choice is like a kinetic energy. OK, so if you're interested in thinking about that, find me. Thank you.